Well, 16 weeks ago when we first met, I started my class by saying, Welcome to General Oceanography. My name is Tom Garrison. This is the best course you could take for a general introduction to the nature of science, the Earth, and how everything fits together. And the next words I said were the, my favorite words in all of higher education. Let me tell you a story. And the story began, as you recall, with a discussion of the general nature of the universe, our place in it, how heavy elements are made, how the Earth came to be, all those kinds of things that usually start in an astronomy class, but you don't expect to get in astronomy. And then we finally got around to forming the Earth up, and making the basins, and watching how plate tectonics move the nature of the seabeds around. We talked about the sediments on the ocean floor, and finally, if you remember, after about five weeks, we finally introduced the subject of water. And you discovered that water is one of the strangest substances around. Water has a remarkably high specific heat. We talked about how the Earth's moderate temperature is responsible, uh, or that's responsible for the moderate temperature of the Earth. We talked about how living things, how biology essentially is mandated by those physical characteristics of water. And how water seems extremely normal to us because we eat it, you know, drink it, swim it, roam over it, all that all the time. And yet, really don't take its remarkable properties for what they are. Then as we continued on, we talked about what happens when water and solar energy interact. We talked about how waves form, how winds blow on the surface of the ocean. Things about the nature of currents and how the currents affect the entire ocean, not just the surface. And we talked about tides. And eventually we put all that energy together and looked at how all the energy in the ocean is involved with coasts. And the subject of the coast was very complicated. I didn't explain to you how complicated because it, I don't understand it myself. But there are two ways of looking at coast called primary and secondary ways of erosional deposit deposition on coast and all that. And then after we were finished with that, I introduced to you the general idea of the players on the stage. We got to the point about 12 weeks in, 11 weeks in, where we were talking about the nature of life on Earth. The one thing I mentioned to you is that the major point of general biology is not diversity. And that's what we're all taught in high school, you know, how the mollusks are different from the arthropods, and we've been studying for the final exam on Wednesday, all that. But in fact, the real point of biology is unity. How all life on the Earth is the same, it's just packaged differently. And that led to the question of, well, what, what would it be like elsewhere? What, what kinds of mechanisms would be used for structure? Would there be proteins as structure? Would there be crystals as structure? What would be the immediate uh, energy relationship? Would there be photosynthesis or chemosynthesis or what? We don't know. We only have one instance on this little beautiful planet of ours to understand how it works. And the story continued with a discussion of the different forms of animal life. We talked about how animals are a very recent addition to the uh, biology of the planet, uh, 600 million years or so. I mean, there was not a lot of, uh, of things that could wander around. There wasn't enough food available. We talked about changes in the atmosphere that the diatoms brought forth. We talked about all this stuff, and at the very end, after we did all the great animals, we talked about the great intelligence and nature of whales, and all those kinds of things we talked about for 15 weeks. I told you that the story would have an unhappy ending. And the ending that I led, ended with last time was that it looks to us, and we don't know for sure, it looks to us like we may very well be alone in the universe. We've spent now since 1963 looking out in space at all kinds of different places, the great Hercules cluster, all these places, the center of our galaxy, the center of other galaxies, all this, to try to find anything that would be non-random, anything at all, any bit of information, any little dollop of the ones and zeros, anything that might be in some way indicative is that there could be life elsewhere. And I told you a story. And that was the story of Easter Island. How when the Polynesian diaspora occurred from the area of the center of the Pacific, there were three huge waves that went out from places like uh, Tahiti. One went to the north, colonized Hawaii, the most distant object in the world to be colonized by people. And the last, one of the very last, the lower left, the Maori, ended up in New Zealand. And to the lower right, almost certainly, completely by accident, the Polynesians found Easter Island. And by the way, just as an aside, there's some good growing data that the Polynesians actually made up to South America, but that's the subject for another day. The people on Easter Island found essentially a paradise. We talked about this last time. And if you read the beginning of chapter 18, you know what the story is. The paradise had ha-ha trees large canoe-building palms that you could make canoes out of. 
all kinds of threads and materials and fibers that you could make fishing line out of. There was a tremendous amount of fruit. There were birds nesting in the area that laid eggs. These people found themselves in a complete paradise. Not a very big one, but a complete one. And over the course of about 400 years, which isn't that long, these people, like fruit flies in a bottle, bred themselves out of that environment. There were simply so many of them that they destroyed all the resources. They couldn't begin to make canoes anymore because any canoe that they might want to make had to have a tree. And they'd already cut all the trees down to make canoes, and that didn't work out. And when the Dutch explorer Roggeveen, we talked about him the other day, when Roggeveen finally got there and saw Easter Island at the beginning of its decline, he made notes, and then about 110 years later, Captain Cook arrives, and Captain Cook says, what are you talking about, Roggeveen? These people are primitive. First of all, there's only about a tenth as many of them as you said there were. And second, there are no canoes. They have these rickety little boats that are supported in, in what looks like hammered fiber. They can hardly go out to their roof to get food. And then later the civilization completely collapsed after Cook left. And we know this from paleontological data, that is data looking at pollen grains that are embedded in sediments in the area of East Island, on land. And they know from the pollen grains that the population apparently died precipitously. These people were actually burning the grasses to expose the hiding places of the bad guys. Now, everybody's a bad guy. I mean, one sect grows up and they say, this is a bad guy, a good guy. And we saw in the Polynesian warfare of Hawaii, about three weeks into our class, how violent these kinds of things could be. Eventually, the only source of protein on East Island was the people. And when the uh, colonizers, the missionaries arrived in Easter Island, it is over. All these Maui, these things that you see right here, they've been tipped over into pits, their faces shattered by spikes. These are either replicas or ones that were completed or whatever, or put back on it. Nobody knows what they were looking for. And these people lived in abject misery. They had completely overbred their situation. You think, well, that's all very interesting, Dr. Science, but so what? Well, as I also mentioned to you last time, we have entered ourselves into a period of what, for lack of a better term, could be called inadvertent global experimentation. I gave, as an example, I gave you a placement for ammonia in refrigerators, as an example. I remember that before the Second World War, <coughs> ammonia was blinding people because women, mostly women, would be uh, chipping out ice from their freezers and they'd puncture a coil and they'd get a face full of pure ammonia gas which if they happen to be breathing in at the time, would be lethal. You know what a little bit of ammonia does in a cleaning solution. Imagine 100%. Also, the DuPont company, at the behest of General Electric, invented a compound called Freon, which had none of those effects, which worked as a very suitable, not quite as good as ammonia, but almost as good uh, refrigerant liquid, and they produced it in huge amounts. And not to go back to this story, but they later found out uh, in the 1960s, that when this stuff is released into the atmosphere, as it would be when a refrigerator is destroyed, junked, that it goes up and nukes the uh, ozone layer, takes out the ozone layer, lets more shortwave ultraviolet radiation in, and skin cancer levels go up, plankton dies in the upper four or five meters of the ocean, and another inadvertent global experiment is done. All these kinds of things, all the ones we've talked about, all the business of making plastic, Plastic doesn't shatter. I remember when I was a kid, my mother dropped a shampoo bottle in the shower and it shattered. And you immediately have to get out very gingerly, carefully, you know, watch out for the shards of glass. Not anymore. We don't have glass shampoo bottles anymore. They're all plastic. There are advancements. At the same time, plastic is a completely non-biodegradable thing. No enzymes in any kind of biological system can touch plastic. And it may upgrade, it may get smaller and smaller to the point now where filter feeders in some parts of the world are mainly filtering bits of microscopic plastic out of the water so the nutritious food. Again, another story. But all these different kinds of things, all these mechanisms involved that look great to start with, end up having consequences in inadvertent experimentation. We don't know where some of these things are going to go. Sometimes we figure it out. In the case of Freon, there have been substitutes for Freon that have been found in all the air conditioners now. If you have a car that was built after 1974, that all has this special skew in it that doesn't hurt the, uh, the high atmosphere of the ozone. But it gets back to another problem, you know, a problem that I hinted at when we were talking about this last Wednesday, and that is the business of growth. And if you think the Chinese economy is growing this year at a rate of about 9.5 percent, actually sorry, it was last year, 8.5 percent this year, 9.5 last year, 
We're all upset because the United States GDP is growing at about a 2.2% annualized pace right now. You know, everybody wants to be about 5% to get jobs back and all that. Longer, a very good idea because the economic model we have, the entire Western world anyway, is based on growth. Well, it's just exactly like the East Carolina situation, if you got it. Because how long can you sustain that kind of growth? How long can you have, essentially, every year has to be better, every house price has to build up, everybody has to make more money, everybody has to do all this sort of thing. Like, what's going to happen? You can see what's going to happen. You don't have to be you know, a rocket scientist to figure out that unlimited growth isn't going to work. On October 31st, interesting date, we passed 7,000 million people in this country, Seven, I mean in this world, 7 billion people. And the growth rate has actually fallen a tad. It used to be 33 years. The growth rate now is about 31 and a half years to double the population. So 31 and a half years from now, maybe 14 million. What's the carrying capacity of the planet? Well, if everybody shares, you know, the, the maximum, minimum amount of space, and every place that you can use to make food is making food, and all income is equally distributed, all processed income, that is food and all the rest is equally distributed, we could probably have a carrying capacity of maybe 20 million uh, humans on the earth, 20 million. We're obviously not going to get to that. We had a speaker last year in our, in our uh, uh, honor speaker for forum who talked about the great crisis. And the great crisis is not going to be oil, although we kind of think that. It's going to be water. Access to clean, functioning water is going to be a thing that will limit populations. And the oil wars that we're going to see in the next few years, those are going to be something, but the water wars may be even more interesting. And the problem we've got is, I mentioned this too, a sort of business of magical thinking. Well, it'll all be fine. You know, we, we, they'll, they'll, maybe religion will solve the problem. I don't think so. Maybe this, maybe, you know, somebody, maybe if we vote for the right presidential candidate, that'll all get sorted out. No. At some point, somebody has to say, let's look at this. Let's look at this critically. Let, let's see what can be done. Now, let me tell you right now, you people who are sitting there, you're not average. You, know, you want to see average, you go to Disneyland on a hot August afternoon, you'll see average. You're not. You're the survivors. You look around, there's a lot of blank seats. We had 558 people in this room the day we started. We have about 304 still enrolled. But you folks who are sitting there right now, you're not average. You're going to have to make the thoughtful decisions and make some ideas, make some, make some judgments that will maybe get in the way of the immediate maximization of every possible thing that you might want, whatever it would be, we'll that point. But the critical point here is, you've got to think about stuff. That's what we do in higher education. That's what you're invited to do. We don't give you the answers. Our greatest goal is to work ourselves out of a job. You can be your own professor after a while. We'll show you how to get the information. We'll step out of the way and let you go get it. As I mentioned to start, one of the critical points, one of the most dangerous points is, excuse me a second, 